Today I'm going to be showing you how to design primers for PCR. This is really simple. There's just a few fundamental rules that you need to know. The issue here is that it's really high stakes because if you mess up the primer design in this beginning stages, you won't really find out that you've messed it up until three weeks into your experiment, you get negative results, you try a million different optimization procedures and realize that it was the primers the whole time. So in this video, I'll make sure that that doesn't happen and you design your primers right the first time. First of all, you'll have a double stranded DNA sequence like this, and you'll want to have a forward primer and a reverse primer. So these primers will bind to the DNA and amplify the DNA sequence starting from the forward primer going to the reverse primer. We'll look at this in more detail in a moment in uh, DNA Viewer, we'll, we'll use Snap Gene, but in the DNA Viewer you'll actually see the DNA sequence uh, and actually be able to select the, the primers that you want to use. But for now I just want to show you on paper so that we can get the fundamentals out of the way. So let's say we're zoomed in on this piece of DNA right here and we'll, we're looking at a primer that binds to this sequence. A forward primer will sit on the top of this strand and look something like this, A, G, C, A, T, dot, dot, dot. It will basically be complementary to the top strand of this double-stranded DNA sequence. And similarly, if we were designing a reverse primer, it would be complementary to the bottom strand of this DNA sequence. And when you actually order these primers from DNA synthesis companies, they come single-stranded, they're not double-stranded. They're meant to bind to one strand of DNA and amplify in a particular direction. So primers are single-stranded pieces of DNA. Here are some rules that you should be thinking about when you're designing your primer. And sometimes all of these rules, you can't exactly follow all of them perfectly when you're designing primers, but you want to get as close as possible to 18 to 24 base pairs in length. This is optimal. You want between 40 and 60 percent GC content and you want the ends to contain uh, G's and C's. So ends contain G's and C's. So you know if you were designing a primer here really you would want to walk it back and have this G sort of tagged at the end. So uh, sort of more fundamentally, the bonds between G's and C's, you know, the guanine and the cytosine nucleotides have three hydrogen bonds, whereas T's and A's, their bonds only have two hydrogen bonds. So the bond between T's and A's is weaker and it will come apart more easily, whereas the bonds between G's and C's is stronger, and so having G's and C's, you know, two to three G's and C's at the end of your primers is optimal. Having just one in my experience uh, is has always been good. Having at least one GC pair at the end of primers is always good. This 18 to 24 base pairs is important because if it's too short, it may be nonspecific and bind to other regions in the DNA. If the primer is too long, it may take too long for the primer to physically bind to the piece of DNA that you want to amplify. So 18 to 24 base pairs is good. I've had primers up to 35 base pairs in length and down to about 16 base pairs of length that work perfectly fine. So the GC content is the other big one. If your GC content is really low, that means you have a lot of A's and T's. So it's AT rich. It's going to bind really weakly to your DNA sequence. If the GC content is very high, it's going to bind really strongly to your sequence, which sounds great, but remember in, in PCR, you actually need the uh, pieces of DNA to come apart from each other. So if the pieces of DNA can't come apart from each other first, then your primer is never going to bind in the first place. So the last thing to consider that I n never really consider in my you know, real primer design that I do, but uh, you know, it's something to think about is secondary structure. So what this means is that potentially the primer that you design could bind to itself in some strange way. Uh, so there are tools online to double check that you don't have any secondary structure. Um, 
But for me personally, I've never had any issues with that. Finally, the thing to consider, and that will be based off of your primer length as well as the GC content, is the melting temperature, which we denote as the TM. So the TM is based on the GC content and the length of the primer. Uh, however, now we have a bunch of different companies making different polymerases and it's probably best just to take your primer and put it into the company's website, select your polymerase, and it will tell you the melting temperature of your primer. And not just your one primer, but specifically what melting temperature you should use for your primer pair in your final PCR that you run. So again, there are ways to calculate TM by hand, but I would highly recommend using your polymerase manufacturer uh, website to find the melting temperature of all of your primer pairs. So that's enough theory. Let's go to the computer and actually design some primers. Okay, so here is the plasmid that I want to work with today. And just for fun, I'm doing this plasmid because it contains CBDAS, which is a gene that produces a enzyme that makes CBD. It's a cannabinoid. You might be familiar with it. So this is SNAP gene. This is just one you know, DNA viewer that you can use, and it's the one that I prefer to use, but it does cost to, to use this software. Fortunately, my university pays for that. Um, but we can go to the sequence level down here and see there's already a bunch of primers uh, designed here, but here's the beginning of the CBDAS gene. And down here, is the end of the CBDAS gene. So let's say, for example, that we want to amplify this gene. First of all, I'm going to turn off the restriction site so it doesn't look so messy. But let's say we want to amplify this gene that actually ends here with this stop code on. Um, first, we'll go to the top just because it'll be easier to, to see how to design a forward primer first. But um, you can see that the beginning of this gene starts with an A. And again, you know, it's best to start a primer with a G or a C, or, you know, it's even better to have two or three Gs and Cs. But in this case, we're sort of forced to have an A at the beginning of this primer. Um, so we can walk out our selection. And what I'm looking for is that TM in the purple to reach 57, because that's typically the uh, melting temperature that I like to use. So this melting temperature now says between 56 and 57, but the length or the length of this primer is 30 base pairs. So there's a lot of problems with this primer based on uh, what I told you in the notebook. But again, when you're designing primers in the real world, nothing is gonna be perfect, right? For example, we have this huge T repeat region, which is not very good. You can see up here in the top left that our GC content is 27%, which again, we're looking for a GC content of 40 to 60%. So that's really low. And we're also starting this primer with an A. So, you know, this is not the best primer, especially to start out, but this is a really real world example of the problems that you run into when you're designing primers, um, especially when you need to amplify a very particular region of DNA. If we want to make this a primer, we can go to primers, add primer. We want to do it on the top strand and we can name the primer. Um, we'll just name it test one for now, add primer to template. So there's our, you know, not so good primer and it's something to be aware of when, you know, doing further experiments. Um, but at least we know it's not designed perfectly and hopefully our reverse primer will be much better. So let's go to the other end of the gene. And this isn't quite annotated right because the stop codon is here uh, and the stop codon ends in, a, ends in a T. So now we're looking at the bottom strand because we're gonna be designing a reverse primer. So we're gonna walk this out to about 57. We'll get to 56. So, this primer, it looks like it's going to be a lot better. So you can see the GC content is 50%. Uh, it said the TM a minute ago, but we'll just add the primer. 
add primer to the bottom strand this time because this is a reverse primer. So bottom strand, we'll name this test two. And that's basically it. You know, in a lot of these DNA viewing tools, you can simulate the uh, PCR amplification of products. And again, really what you need to do is take these, copy these primers and put them into, uh, you know, the website of your choice that uh, is a melting temperature calculator. I would recommend Googling TM calculator Q5 polymerase, for example. I use Q5 polymerase from NEB. Um, or maybe use TAC polymerase and you say TM calculator TAC polymerase. And the first result is probably going to get you there. So you can copy your reverse primer, copy your forward primer, and put them into the calculator. And it will probably also tell you about any warnings about, you know, secondary structures with the primers as well. And it is important, you know, you might choose a different melting temperature. I chose 57 here. That's usually what I go with. But if you use a different melting temperature, just make sure your forward and reverse primers have the same melting temperature. So that's everything with designing primers. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If this video helped you. Please leave a like, subscribe to the channel. I'll be posting more synthetic biology sort of basics as well as any projects that I end up taking up. So, you know, follow along with the channel. Thanks for watching. Bye.